Actually, she took a hiatus. Okay, I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Citizens Transportation and Advisory Committee to order. If uh, you would call the roll, please. Mike Sharpenberg. Here. Matthew Rowe. Here. Tamara Banks. Tamara, Tamara Banks. Josh Brock. Here. Morgan Burke. Present. John Castellaren. Here. Justin Chenault. Jacob Clay. Here. Micah Cunningham. Tara Durant. Patricia and Carnacion. Hubert Farley. Mr. Farley let us know that he's ill and uh, may not be able to attend. Glenn Goldsmith. Larry Gross. Mr. Gross also advised uh, he's out of town and not able to attend this evening. Jaron Hayes of King George also let the chair and myself know she's not able to attend this evening. Uh, as well as Neil Holleran, unable to attend. Michael Hoyt, Travis King, Nicholas Kwatnowski, David McLaughlin, Here. Ken Pogue, James Powell, Dustin Savage, David Swan, Here. Rodney Thomas Here. is attending remotely. Yeah, I think they Uh-huh. Good Here. evening, Rodney. Good evening. Can you hear us okay, Ryan? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, very well, thanks. Great. Are there any other CTAC members whose name I've not called? You have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, just to review, we, since we have a recorder that's capturing minutes, if you, you know, if you make a motion or make a comment, please identify yourself so the recorder knows who is making the comment. All right, first thing I'd like to uh, address is approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, uh, can I have a motion for approval of the agenda as rendered? David Swan, I'll make the motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Morgan Birch. Great. Okay, discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the agenda as uh, rendered is approved. Now, uh, I hope everybody's had a chance to look through the minutes of the last meeting. I know uh, Dave has got a, Dave McLaughlin has got a uh, modification to the minutes. Go ahead. Okay, on uh, eight, uh, item 8B, okay. uh, it, it says it was unanimous, um, and I can understand why. I voted against it, but I was voting remotely, and I got stepped on by Neil, and even David said, hey, did somebody say nay? And so anyway. Yeah, I thought I... So it, it, it doesn't change the outcome, anyway, but it was not unanimous. That's the only thing. Okay. okay. It wasn't unanimous. And, and for the record, that I voted on Okay. Are there any other? And hold on, that was um, eight B. B. There's no two or eight B. Yeah, two. Whatever. There's a two. Two is the one that says unanimous. There's no B. Uh, so this is the amendment to goals to improve accessibility outcomes. That's correct. Okay. And uh, oh, okay, so just motion vote. passes. Voice vote. I said. Yeah, just motion passes. Great. Right. Thank you. Any other changes to the minutes? Hearing no other changes, please go. I was wondering, wasn't that, for accuracy, the, didn't we drop the oh, 8A1? Wasn't that all the large part of uh, the review of the policy committee? Kind of just threw it into that section so that the order of it was thrown off a little bit because if we looked at the six with public comments, I looked at the video again. We did call for the public comments. Then we went to old business. Then we went to 8A2. And then skipped over the second public comments. 
We, we start off. We, we, we forgot. We start off. We, we forgot by amending the amendments. So I mean, amending the agenda. Yeah. Delete some items. Yeah, and 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 so eight eight, eight one got shifted oh, in with it's a different label. Five. Yeah. So it got it got all moved around. Yeah. We covered the same concepts. It's just the order of the meeting. Yes. Yes. So the numbering on the minutes to match the original. Agenda numbering. Yeah. We've got that a, a bit goofed yeah. up. Yes, thank you. That's great. Okay. Are there any other comments or corrections to minutes? Hearing none, can I have a motion to accept the amended minutes? I'll move to. No, John Kessler and move to accept the minutes as amended. Is there a second? Jacob Blake from Spotsylvania. I'll second it. Okay. Any discussion? Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of adopting the amended minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Standing Morgan Birch. We have uh, two, three abstentions for people who weren't here, okay. And who, what were those uh, uh, three abstentions? Morgan Birch was one? Matt Rose. Great. Who's up? And Nicholas Kwanowski. I was here. Great. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. Item uh, five, the uh, policy committee meeting. I'll let uh, Ms. Golden give you the, the her assessment, and then I'll amplify a little bit. Okay. Great. Um, Mr. Ollis uh, was the uh, lead here uh, on this, of course, and. Um, one of the action items was a presentation by uh, Virginia Railway Express on ridership trends before and during COVID. And um, you'll be glad to know that between January and March, uh, ridership on the VRE grew uh, significantly and doubled to about 100 riders per month. The pre-pandemic uh, uh, total is about 300,000 uh, per month. So we're about a, a third of of pre-pandemic levels, but growing. There was a presentation on the I-95 outer connector history, and also Michelle Shropshire of VDOT uh, uh, gave a, a, a good uh, presentation on how an idea becomes a project. I think most of you are familiar with the outer connector history, and uh, Ms. Shropshire's uh, presentation, here's kind of the order of go, how an idea becomes a project. You identify the issue or the problem to be solved. You have an initial concept or idea, often derived from uh, high-level planning studies. A concept is then incorporated into the MPO's long-range transportation plan, and then the uh, constrained long-range transportation plan that involves funding. Then initiation of uh, NEPA, which is the National Environmental Protection Agency process, and a traffic analysis. And then explore funding opportunities and then design and delivery. Ms. Barber of FAMPO staff gave a smart scale uh, presentation. There were um, uh, lists of uh, projects to be uh, brought forward. Uh, those sponsored by the um, GWRC and then some uh, by the FAMPO staff. And they were listed and uh, provided as follows. The GWRC projects are a Stafford County project for, to improve the U.S. Lay Hill Road intersection, another Stafford County project for Interport Parkway and Route 1 improvements. Also, a staffing project for Warrington Road bike and pedestrian improvements on this section of US 17 that lacks sidewalk uh, west of the recently improved uh, uh, portion. Also, Tidewater Trail Route 2 improvements, a big, big project uh, joint venture uh, crosses the line in the city of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County. And Lafayette Boulevard Roadway and Bike Pet Improvements, again, that straddles the city and Spotsylvania line. Of those five GWRC projects, uh, one of those will be uh, uh, dropped and the four will move uh, forward for uh, funding. The FAMFO projects uh, started out at five, but Spotsylvania County 
uh, uh, retracted one of them. So all four of these will move as FANPO projects. The uh, Virginia Central Railway uh, Regional Project uh, is one. Uh, I-95 widening to eight lanes. US-1 uh, Lassen Lane to Idlewild Boulevard. And US-1 Massaponics Corridor. The next uh, were some opportunities there was some additional funding uh, provided uh, for the two programs we discussed a little bit last time, the congestion mitigation air quality and the surface transportation block grant uh, projects. Uh, this was good news. Additional funding came uh, to, the, uh, to the region sort of at the last minute. And uh, Jordan Chandler uh, of FAMPO staff and Ian and, and the technical advisory committee worked together to fund these projects. Uh, we have the Route 1, uh, Exit 126, southbound improvements. This improves the operations uh, going southbound uh, on 95. Garrisonville Road widening received some additional funding, I believe design money for both those. And we uh, also um, uh, needed a little bit of money to close out the, sta the FAMPO staff's effort uh, for our development of the Long Range Transportation Plan and a small amount for the upcoming September freight summit uh, for us to engage a consultant and hold that uh, activity. Real good news on the CMAX side uh, to fund the requested amounts. These are remaining amounts that were needed to complete these projects. Uh, the Harrison Road VCR Trail, Stafford Borough Boulevard Sidewalk, and the Bankside Trail uh, Phase 1 in the City of Fredericksburg. And then uh, we also were able to fund a need for Spotsylvania new transit and leased commuter parking spaces and a partial uh, uh, funding to, uh, there's a need to, to purchase uh, three additional FRED buses and they were able to uh, maybe get a bus and a half or maybe two buses with the money that was left over. Uh, go, going on to the uh, remaining portion of the policy committee agenda, uh, we will be presenting to you this evening the highlights of the fiscal year 23 unified work program. So I'll uh, save that for later today. And then there's a, a bylaws discussion. Um, I, I did, uh, uh, did make a hard copy of the um, proposed bylaw changes that have been on the policy committee agenda for consideration, if anybody wants to take a look at those. That concludes my presentation. But they did not address those as possible. No, they did not, uh, but this is a copy. Yes, because, sir. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin was not there, and then he's the, the proponent for that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And so okay. that concludes the presentation of the policy committee highlights. Okay. Also at the meeting, uh, I gave a short presentation as a member of the policy committee of the four slides that you saw previously. Uh, brief those present uh, remotely or in attendance uh, as to what we were looking at, uh, the eastern and western connector, roughly where it would go, some uh, strengths and weaknesses, and generally, at least in my perception, I think it was pretty well received by most of the jurisdictions that were present. So obviously that's first blush. There are a lot of details that have to be worked out, but uh, I think uh, many of the people present uh, were receptive of the idea, and we'll talk about next steps a little later on in tonight's agenda. Any questions for either me or for Becky? Sure. Chair, sure. I have a question. I remember it's been a couple of years now, probably four years, we had a supervisor from King George who sat on the Federal Air Quality Committee. Uh, I remember she's a very petite woman, just a firecracker, really good at what she did. She, she represented the region on air quality. And I just want to know, I, I never heard it because she's no longer a supervisor. In fact, one of the CTAC members became the supervisor. I don't recall her name right now but replaced her, and I think she beat her in the primary. But I'm wondering who is representing the region here for air quality? 
at the federal level. Because she was very active. I don't know if you remember that, Dave. No, I'm trying to hear. I'm, trying to think. I'm just trying to think of her name. Uh, uh, well, you probably you didn't see her because she was on the policy committee. Yeah. She was a member of the policy committee as a supervisor. She wasn't in the CTAC. And then one of our CTAC members who used to sit down here uh, from King George when I was chairman uh, ran for supervisor. She left the committee and ran for supervisor in one. And I don't know if she assumed that role or not, but it'd be probably worth asking and checking because uh, the representative and the policy committee meetings I attended as the chairman here, she would give an update on how well we were doing. From an emissions standpoint? From emissions, from policy, from what's happening at the federal level, funding, was it good? Was it Ruby Grapo? Yes, it was yeah. Ruby. And you, if you know Ruby, uh, Ruby uh, is, is a very active at whatever she does. Do the planning regions have a, a link into that, or how is that organized? I don't know because I, I never questioned it because she was it. Ruby was Ruby was everything. And I don't know if you know her that well. Yeah. I, I do remember a couple yeah. of times that I was at where she was there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's do some checking because I'm not Looking sure there is a regional or a statewide or federal structure. It's important to us there. because we mention uh, CMAC all the time. Mm -hmm. here, you know, funding and and, and it, I don't know, it's important I think to us. I think it's a subset of the Federal Highway Administration organization. It might be. We'll investigate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I have one comment since we're talking about it as, as under the minute or the discussion about the results of the PC. So one of the concerns I had when we talked about this at our meeting last week about or last month about approving Hank to go forward and say this is what we wanted him to say was that uh, I had concerns. We thought I thought we should go for the technical committee first, and, and that yeah. I thought he might get to. You know, too aggressive and saying, this is, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this. And he said, no, I'm just going to provide, I'm going to provide concepts. These are initial, these are fundamental, you know. And and in about five or six minutes, that's what he did. It wasn't, you know, and he, and he didn't get into big debates with the question and answer. And so uh, I, uh, you did what I didn't think you were going to do, and so I applaud you for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure whether to thank you or applaud you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. what I wanted you to do, and you did it. I think she here who hasn't listened to that meeting, I mean, it's it's about what about uh, three, three quarters of the way maybe through the day. I please do. I, I think he'll find it to be beneficial. And so she listen started to talking at the one hour and thirty three minute and forty second. I it was forty one. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. But it was good. It was excellent. I encourage anybody who wants to, to come to those. Uh, you can't participate except during the public comment portion, but by all means, give people your perspective on things. Because sometimes viewpoints may be somewhat narrow, and this is a great opportunity for, you all are much more versed in this than I am, to go tell these folks what they think, or what you think. I'm only versed and driving around everywhere. <laughs> That's expertise of a certain yes, it's an Uber driver. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay. Any other comments about the uh, brief back on the policy committee? It, again, we'll talk a little bit more about next steps further on in the presentation. Okay. Um, public comment. I won't forget this one this time. <laughs> Are there any uh, members of the public present or online that would like to make a comment to the CTEC? Okay, hearing none, we'll go ahead and continue to old business. Uh, unified planning work program first. Great. Um, the unified work um, uh, plan is, uh, uh, is uh, up for public comment, and the highlights are as follows. The highlights of the UPWP are the upcoming uh, 2022 Freight Summit, the FRED Transit Strategic Plan, 
the FAMPO vision plan, which will, uh, Coley Tazell will talk about here in a moment on your agenda, the East-West Mobility Study, and the VCR Trail Study. There are two projects uh, that were in the FY22 UPWP that are not in this one because the uh, funding did not, does not run through uh, our books. They were somewhat placeholders in the old, in the 22 active uh, current plan. That's the 610 operational study in Stafford. Stafford will be managing that. And the GW Ride Connect strategic uh, transit uh, uh, Strategic Transit Plan uh, will be managed by them, by that group. We also um, had good input from uh, Paul and Yellow of uh, Spotsylvania County to make sure we had in there a work line item to have an annual update to the constrained long range plan as requested. So the way that's worded somewhat seals the deal that we're only going to to amend the uh, constrained long-range uh, plan once a year, and um, the staff time uh, devoted to that is, is there, thereby acknowledged. Also, we incorporated um, amendments to the uh, work program that will be uh, imposed by the new um, federal legislation, uh, the, the uh, infrastructure. We also added items uh, regarding the impact of the census on the urbanized area and the staff efforts if there are changes to that urbanized area through the census. So that's the highlight of the UPWP. And then Ms. Uh, yes, sir. Comment, actually, I think. For people who might be looking in, people who might look at this later on because it's recorded, for people who are due to what is the UPWC <laughs> and why is it important? Yes, the Unified Pro Program Work, shoot, what's the second piece? What's the first piece, Dan? Unified Planning Work sure. Program. Um, and Mrs. L has it on the, on the screen there. It's a document that pretty much outlines what FAMPO staff does for the whole fiscal year and what we uh, estimate those costs to be and, and percent of time and effort to be. So it's a very important document that is out for public comment now and it guides our work for the, for the fiscal year 23. I mean, in an extreme case, someone from the public is like, why are you doing that? Study putting money against that. Yes, yes, and it also also makes sure um, if there's something that comes uh, that's not in that uh, current uh, uh, plan once it's adopted that we have a formal amendment to the plan to uh, for that staff effort to be adopted by the public, if you will. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. If I could just add a comment. The, the point of that is we don't know how to spend money as staff without approval. And so once a year we present this program, we're required federally by federal law to present this program to say, this is what we're gonna spend the funds allocated to us as a staff. So this is not for projects to build a road or something. This is to fund the operation of FAMPA, to run these meetings, to pay staff salaries, to pay the rent on the building, to, to, to run the operation. So all the operational stuff that we do have to be publicly declared, and we have to give the public opportunities to comment and make amendments to it, because it's public money that we use to run FAMPO. So this is about the internal money that we use to run FAMPO, and we may not spend a dime unless it's specified in the document. So once a year we produce this document, and if, if things come up, in the interim that we wish to spend money on, we've got to come back to you and to the public to say we'd like to make an amendment because this thing has happened, we need to spend some money on it. So we try to guess in advance how much money we're going to spend in the 12 months and what we're going to spend it on so that we declare publicly to all and sundry, this is how we're going to spend the money you've entrusted us with. And that's why this is important to tell all of our four committees because it's the one opportunity each year when you get to say, you spend too much money on napkins, or you should spend more money on X. So this is your chance. 
it's going to be voted on on the 23rd, and then it will be uh, almost set in stone for the next 12 months. So this is your one chance to say we like what you do or we think you should change something. And this is available on the website now? It's on the yeah. website. Okay. And one last comment, there's one other project I added at the last minute, which is in the document, um, with the approval of the of the And that is to, to start discussions with our jurisdictions about what is called transit-oriented development. So a lot of what you're talking about at the moment is about increasing capacity to transport people to other places, whether it's Hank's plan to build some out of connectors, or whether it's a plan that you buy a proposed on transit or bike and pedestrians and stuff. That's all about increasing capacity to move yeah. people. So transit oriented development is the opposite. Approve it. Policy committee and federal government reviews. Mm -hmm. So transit oriented development is the opposite. We try to bring the housing and the jobs closer so that you don't have to travel. So transit oriented development tries to build housing and work opportunities in the same place or close to a big transit center such as the train station so that you can walk across the road and get on the train and drive the train to the Pentagon where you work. You don't need a car, which means less people will be on the road in front of you. The transit development is the opposite. We don't try to increase capacity of roads and train lines or bus, bus systems. We try and remove the need for putting additional vehicles on the road by building everything that you need to get to close to a big transit center, like a train station or the Red Central Transit Center on US-1. So that transit oriented development, I've put in an opportunity in this plan that we can at least begin a discussion with the jurisdictions about putting the construction closer to the transit or building houses and jobs in the same place so you can walk across the road to your job. So we remove the need for all those extra vehicles on the road. That's what that is. It's a small new initiative. We're just going to start with it this year. Great. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So please make your comments if you have any. Yeah, any questions or comments concerning the uh, Unified Planning Work Program? Okay, let's go on to Great. the next item. The Rural Work Program is for Caroline and King George uh, counties and is adopted by the GWRC. The highlights for King George County in the uh, current RWP are the Trailways Feasibility Study Implementation to assist in analyzing and prioritizing recommendations from the Trailways Feasibility Study and assist in grant application development for high priority projects. The Barnesfield Park Access Study to study options for improved access to Barnesfield Park and provide recommendations consistent with the goals of the 2017 US 301 Route 207 Arterial Preservation Study. Assistance with grant applications to Economic Development Authority Department of uh, uh, Department or other entities for industrial development sites. In both counties includes the effort for preparation for and participation in the freight summit. In Caroline County, assist with development of the transportation component of Caroline County's comprehensive plan, including mapping, analysis, and narrative development for that transportation element in their comp plan. The Ladysmith Transportation Plan expand on the Ladysmith Bike Ped Plan to encompass all transportation modes, analysis and mapping for mobility, access management and safety consistent with smart scale, arterial preservation, and other guidelines to establish a foundation for VDOT traffic safety. And funding, uh, funding sources guidance to research and compile funding sources for improvements to the Route 639 Lady Smith Road Bridge over I-95 to accommodate bike and ped facilities and other needed improvements in the county growth areas. And uh, that concludes the list of projects in the RWP rural work plan for those two counties. Anybody have any comments? Does that one open up public comment, too? No. 
Unfortunately, you missed your opportunity. It was on your agenda last month that you removed it. You remember you voted to remove the minor? That was one of the items on Barclay's agenda, but it's too late now because the GWRC board has already um, voted to approve it. So you can't make comments at this stage, but at least we wanted to bring it back and make you aware of it because you didn't skip over it last time. And what Ian did not say is we wanted to get you out of here before midnight. So that's why we did a little bit of manipulation of the uh, agenda and deferred that particular item. Okay. Um, let's see. Member discussion. First item uh, is next month is the election of the CTAC chair and vice chair. And if you are interested in running for the position, uh, I guess come to the meeting and have somebody nominate you um, if you would like to, to do one of those two positions. Yeah, please let's not have vacancies. You need to fill both positions at the next meeting. But by right, the chair should be staff because it rotates by our bylaws. Well, uh, we're, we're uh, our chair is from staff. Right. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so that everybody knows, I intend to offer to serve another term so I can take what I have started through. There is a provision that uh, if the, the CTAC chooses to have successive appointments, they can do that. Otherwise, if there is no, if there's a vacancy, the preference is to rotate positions. So I just want to let everybody know that uh, I'm going to run again if you choose to keep it. I disagree with how you present it. It's not a preference, it is by bylaw that it rotates. However, the preference could be they don't rotate it and you serve it. Yeah. Interesting That's said very that. likely, and I would I would yeah. be in favor of that. But but I mean yeah. it really the, the persons the people who need to speak up would would come from Stafford, and then uh, the, uh, Actually, the vice chair would then come from. Actually, from sorry, I don't think that's correct. The Pennsylvania opportunity skipped because they did not have a candidate, yeah. and your current chair is from Stafford. Your last chair from the city. Oh, you're right. I got that. You could actually vote right. to the city right. as Fine. being the chair, and Sparky should be the vice chair. Right. Yeah. How about I read from the bylaws? That's a good thing. Yeah, okay. Uh, it says the chairman and vice chairman shall serve for one year with the option to be reappointed for successive terms by the CTEC. The officer position shall rotate unless excessively appointed on a yearly basis between the respective jurisdictions. So every jurisdiction receives an equal opportunity to serve in each of the respective officer positions. So uh, you can digest that, read it, but that's exactly what the bylaws say. So that's clear. Okay. Um, any questions about that election? That will be done next year and the term- Next month. Um, I mean, next month. And the term is for the fiscal year. Is it possible? to initiate a review of the bylaws to determine the necessity of having positions being geologically bound and, you know, in, in succession like that? What's the, what's the necessity for that, anyway? You've already been through that. It's a good question. It's really, it's, really it, it, it's seemingly innocuous to have somebody, to have multiple, I mean, it could be somebody else on the same committee from the same locale. Well, I, I think the latitude is there if somebody wants to continue to serve. But they have to be nominated, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if I can just uh, put that in context. Um, BAMPO allocates a large amount of funding. We're going to allocate next Monday night. Um, forget how much the total is, but it's several million dollars that we're going to allocate to projects. And because we have three jurisdictions in BAMPO, you are competing on a competitive basis for that funding. There is a perception that there's a built-in conflict yeah. in the structure of FAMPA. And because there is this built-in conflict, it's been made mandatory that the policy committee chairmanship rotates every year. And FAMPA's other committees, the intention was that a similar arrangement occurs, that the committees rotate between the three, three jurisdictions that are competing for the funding so that the perception is that there's no favoritism and that there's a chance for all the jurisdictions to have a turn at running each of the committees. That's the basis yeah. of the way the thing was set up. However, the committee bylaws aren't all identical. The FAMPA Policy Committee absolutely bans outright the 
chairperson serving more than one year before the next jurisdiction gets to choose a chairperson. That's just completely bad. TAC is in the same position. It rotates automatically. The CTAC and the BPAC have kind of changed bits and pieces of that system. The BPAC is a slightly different animal. It only meets every second month and it went into recess for a while and they resuscitated and it has slightly different bylaws to, for example, the CTAC. They don't have a representative from DPAC on the policy committee and they would like to change that because they feel like they're being left out. This committee similarly slightly changed it, but it, it, the principle was similar, and you'll see that in the bylaws, that it's supposed to rotate between the three jurisdictions. But this caveat was introduced in the CTAC the bylaws and Hank is correct that you can elect the same person for a second year, but only two years. After the second year, it has to rotate whether you like it or not. So it, it doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say it that. It does not say that. And so, Ian, right. we need to be very precise on the wording because it says, now, just so everybody knows, I don't, I am not intending to establish a dynasty. I would like to continue this effort for the following year to provide some continuity, and then I will be happy to fade into obscurity. But I've reread this. It's very explicit what is and what is not allowed. So we, if you have questions, please reread the bylaws. Now, back to your original question. I don't know what the mechanism is for proposing changes to the bylaws and then getting it blessed. And I would, the change gets proposed, it gets voted on by a supermajority of the committee. Yeah. What would yeah. be defined as a supermajority? 60%? Two thirds of this, of this sitting committee, of, of current membership of current membership. So does that mean that they have to be present also? I would hope so, if they're going to vote. Yes. Well, no, I'm saying it's current membership, not present members. It has to be two-thirds of current membership. Where are you reading this? What's that? In the Bible? I'm not saying right now. <laughs> I don't remember that in the Bible. Yeah. I think it's... I, think I rewrote it. it. Can, you, can we defer... All right, can we defer the answer to yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, we'll, I'll do them back in search and come back. Yeah, yeah we'll, yeah. we'll go look at the bylaws and, and, and take a hard look. We'll add a, a, an agenda item. Uh, I think the, the desire is to examine whether the uh, exclu um, uh, exclusive um, rotation is, is a, 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 a potential amendment to the bylaws to revise the current statements with regard to jurisdiction rotation. Is that... Yes. In other words, yeah. make it like the policy. And I have a reason for asking, right? It's not, uh, you know, we are an advisory committee, we make no policy, but whenever you have somebody in a position that is able to implement Robert's rules appropriately and they have a sound gavel, you don't want to get rid of them just because, <laughs> just because the, the policy committee has to, right? I think, yeah. Anyway. Great, great. We'll add an yeah. agenda item to your text. Okay. We're not bound by what the policy committee does, is basically. Great. All right. Any other discussions about that? Yes, sir. I'm, I might have missed it um, because I'm still like relatively new uh, to this committee. But is it to run for chair, or vice chair? Is it correct? Did you say that you have to be like from Stafford for the chair yeah. position? Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, the preference would be it, when at all, when feasible, yes. But it is not written in stone. So it's not you, defined. It just says defined. it shall um, uh, rotate unless successfully appointed on a right. yearly basis right. between. Right. So there is no framework on w which ones are in, in turn can jump yeah. around. So this sounds like a like an unwritten thing that people have been doing. It's in, it's in the bylaws. I, mean, I, I think they made that it for shall. So it needs to. Yeah. It shall happen successfully, but it doesn't define which region needs to be in what order, so it's just no, a it's shelf. Just, and then there should be an equal opportunity. Equal, equal opportunity, opportunity. yeah. That would imply that they each have a turn. And so the every um, jurisdiction receives an equal opportunity to serve in each of the respective office or positions. So. That's right. Just wanted some clarification. Look, we went through this change, right? The change had always been there was no, it was one year before we right. changed it. And it rotated. Just like the policy, it rotated, period, died. So if they took over, the next person had to come from Fredericksburg. 
That was it. That wasn't, you know, now, if you couldn't get it for Fredericksburg, then I guess we've got to come up with something. So I it was Fredericksburg's turn. turn because it was turn. Yeah. And then it was these Spotsies. Spotsies came with. So, uh, so it, 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 we had to do that. Um, then we added, hey, if somebody's doing all right where everybody's having, we yeah. could let them do it twice. So it's we, by agreement. So the, the idea of, re, you know, if, if, if you served, I've served, you served, it's got to be another jurisdiction in order yeah. that would oppose you for a second here. That's right. right. I think the way that it would work Just once sense. would be that there would be a vote on you specifically. And if yeah. you're reelected, then you're reelected. If you weren't reelected, no, no. then it no. would. There's a vote of nominees, and then there's a ballot. And if one person captures the majority of the ballots, that person's it. If not, there's a runoff. That's the way that works. The oh. point is, though, that Sam Fredericksburg could not nominate somebody. Well, could not be a and also be, because we're, it's not in order. And it also couldn't be a different Why does it say that? Hang on a second, Dave. How about that, Dave? I'm not sure. Hang on a second again. I think that's right. You, uh, you, you're saying Fredericksburg when you actually mean Stafford. Because the current chair is not from Fredericksburg, it's from Stafford. No, I'm, but I'm saying I was the last one on Fredericksburg. So oh, I know yeah. somebody from Fredericksburg yeah. is not in turn next. Because it's got to be one, you know, it's one more jerk. It, but it doesn't say that, Dave. No, that, that is the whole say thing that it's on the chair. the rotation. All it says is that you can get reelected, but whoever right. is the chair after you, whether it's next month or next year or three years from now, can't be from Stafford. It would right. have to be from somewhere else. Yeah. You could go back and forth yeah, between two. You right. can be reelected successively, but then it has to go to another jurisdiction after you. Um, only for one more year. It doesn't say you have to go in a specific order. Yeah, you could, yeah I, think, I could go back and forth. I think that's an unwritten rule. Uh, it would be Fredericksburg, Spotty, Stafford, Fredericksburg, Spotty, Stafford, yeah. Stafford order, but it no, just but has to go. So it's not what I could probably it's, see that. I don't want to order. spend money on a lawyer, but it, that kind of makes sense. Um, they just rotate, just like this is the policy committee and the, and the PAC, and all of them, it's rotate. It's not anybody who's not the well, then how do Well, then how do we know who's the next in the rotation? There's been a recognizes there's been a rotation that's not on her. Yeah. Had a hand up. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, didn't we skip? Okay. Didn't we skip spots? Chair, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to correct myself from earlier. Um, Article 8, the amendment, the, um, in order to amend the bylaws, it should be. Uh, these bylaws shall be made by, I'm sorry, any amendments to these bylaws shall be made by a majority vote of the members present at the CTAC meeting. Yes. So that's what we've in for next week. Right? Okay. We've got that conflated right. different right. bodies last time. <laughs> so. Can I just suggest that you don't make amendments next time that nobody has seen before the meeting? Because if you do that, there may, for example, be some legal technical problems with the, with the suggested amendment. So if you want to make amendments at the next meeting, can I suggest that you send staff those amendments now, like this week, so that we can no. ask the legal counsel to discuss if they're fine. We, we do have occasions where people propose uh, particular amendments, and then we find out later that they should be worded differently because it creates an internal conflict within the bylaws, or there's some FOIA rule that you're violating, or whatever else. We okay. can't check them if you suddenly say at the next meeting, can we tonight vote to change that we're going to have four chairs instead of one? Well, we don't have the opportunity to check whether that is legally acceptable. I'll submit to you two this week, give you ample time to get counsel to review it. And Thank you. Right. Great. Great. You have a comment? Yeah, I have a question. Um, perhaps would it be worthwhile considering the discussion we've had to um, possibly consider an amendment that would clarify that language. There does seem to be confusion over the rotation versus and, and equal opportunity language. So that if we decide to stick with the order that, that is described, maybe make that an explicit rule. Sure. As opposed to an implicit interpretation of, of that rule. I think it's implicit. Any any amendments that you wish to propose, please send them in writing. We will then ask uh, council whether those are appropriate and we will give you the feedback. Okay. Any other discussion? No, go ahead. I, I was just joking. Okay. Um, I have a, just a comment. Go ahead. If everybody would show up, 
when they're supposed to, you wouldn't have a difficulty with well, you know, equity and quality. The representation has to pick up because I think we have one spot, see, I'm not blaming you, but you know, it's, it's things like that that cause us to go, we drift off our bylaws and the things that we do here. And there's a perception that somebody is getting an advantage financially, some jurisdiction. I will be handing out checks later. <laughs> I believe, and I'm not making a joke of this, but I believe the policy committee in the last <laughs> eight, ten months went through that. And it got rather ugly. Mm. I seem to remember that. I didn't know all the details, but I did read their minutes, and it was it was ugly. And we don't want to get into that. So I think the, the thing for us to do to stabilize our efficiency as a committee is to show up. And, and, and if you're from, and we're from Stafford and you know, I can't make it, I should call you and say, hey, I'm not gonna make it. Please make sure that if you do or call one of our other members and show up. Yeah, and the adjunct to that would be and participate. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Because, uh, I'll call you back to some things I said several months ago. These little focus areas, they really are a great vehicle for you as a knowledgeable member of CTAC to get in front of organizations and encourage their input or find out what scratches their itch because I'm still not convinced, and you made this comment and Dave made this comment, how well known we are or if anybody cares. And I think we need to be advocates not for a particular solution, but for transportation solutions once they've been vetted and voted on and thought through so that the public is involved. Otherwise, the only time they get involved is when they're sitting in traffic or the train breaks down and they're cursing every elected official for putting them in that predicament. And you know, in that great comments strip, I'm showing my age pogo. We have met the enemy and he is us. We need to, and I saw all these Blank faces, okay, I got it. I'm a lot older than most of you. But we need to participate for that reason, get Jump. people engaged. But thank you for your comment. Mr. Chair, could I just add one thing on that? Please. You'll recall that I was employed to lead the team, the soft team, when that was the okay. case. When I arrived in Fredericksburg, I could not even get a forum for a policy committee meeting that people would not come. It, was ugly. it took me some months and a lot of coffees and beers and talks <laughs> to a lot of people to get the policy committee back to functional level. And I'm not saying I did it myself, but together we worked on putting that thing back together again. So it is important to try to keep the equality, fairness, balance, and all that kind of thing in FAMBO because when it gets acrimonious, you can't allocate funding anymore because people won't even talk to each other. So to yeah. try to keep the balance going in the organization is that's what I add to Okay. Anybody have anything else they'd like to add to that? I ask you to Google acrimonious real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Google no shame. The Google no shame. Tampa Policy Committee 2020. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a bunch of returns. The definition okay. of acrimony. Uh, June. I'd like to go to the uh, vision survey. Uh, Coley, will you uh, do this? And Coley Tuzel, our liaison yeah. partner. Yeah. Get this themselves. I'm just making sure it's showing up for people online as well. Great. So uh, the FAMPO Future Vision Survey um, details, um, we just wanted to, so as you know, uh, FAMPO is um, trying to be equitable and fair and everything, and so we're searching for your all's um, ideas of what FAMPO means what it needs to do. And so we're in the process of developing a vision statement for FAMBO, and uh, the, we're sending out a survey. The survey is 10 questions. Um, most are still uh, like, 
give me your comments, <laughs> but some are rearranging like your orders from most important to you to least important to you. Um, but yeah, so, so it's a variety of response styles and every member will receive a unique survey number, so you all remain anonymous and each member will be um, emailed the survey directly. So we're going to be asking you to uh, respond to the survey by May 31st. Um, that's a Tuesday, but if you could get it out, if you could finish it in the next week, that's awesome. Um, and I'll be following up with you with an email if you um, haven't submitted the survey. And um, after we receive all the surveys, Will the FAMPA staff um, will compile the data and present that data to each committee so you all will see this again. Um, and then FAMPA staff will take into consideration the survey results and do some other research and create a draft vision document for FAMPA. So to clarify, uh, uh, you'll be sending the survey to these folks Tomorrow? Yeah. Oh. How many questions? About ten. <laughs> <laughs> we have the survey already. That came. Pass fail. Okay. Just <laughs> quick, little thank you. I don't have any. Multiple choice. Right. Very good. Thank you. No, it's not. Multiple choice. Is there a study guide? It's just your opinions and <laughs> how you believe. And what things you believe in for this area. So, thank you for you all are all very good at you know sharing your passions. So, um, <laughs> expect some awesome answers. <laughs> all right. Any questions about the survey? Okay. Um, let's talk about amendments to the uh, 2050 transportation uh, program. And generally, in two areas. One, you endorsed at the last meeting. Uh, amendments or to the goals to improve accessibility outcomes for, for handicap. And uh, that was met with uh, pretty positive feedback by people in the community. Uh, there is one glitch in that things that are being, con and correct me if I'm wrong, things that are being constructed from this point forward are done so and reviewed from the standpoint of maximizing accessibility capabilities to the degree possible. The issue, though, is for those things in existence, uh, if your localities were to go ahead and do improvements to existing. Now, when I said it's already mandated for new construction, but for existing construction, let's say uh, King George was going to go ahead and do uh, some upgrades to some of their roads. The law does not mandate it. The, purposes of, uh, the purpose of the letters that you, you got in your agenda packet were to encourage the various jurisdictions to adopt these kinds of things to the degree possible, and obviously there are constraints with, with funding availability and so on, but uh, to remind them of that and encourage them to incorporate that in any improvements they make to existing infrastructure. Have I captured that right? Yes. and. Um the, um, during the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee meeting, uh, Mr. Ellis had three great slides that I thought would summarize and give you a picture of the, outer, of the uh, proposal that uh, uh, CTAC is uh, considering. The, uh, this slide is, that the, uh, uh, is sort of the status of it, uh, and the, the two uh, roads are mainly in Stafford. I think they're all on the same item. No, we're, we're still on the first one. Hold, you hold off just one second. Yeah, we're talking about the uh, the letters and the uh, the amendments. I I jumped out of sequence here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you because were... it tied into the long range transportation. All right, my, my so mistake. we'll hold that. You're on number two. Yeah. So great. Just to, to finalize that, I see this as an excellent opportunity for our uh, focus sub focus groups to help localities prioritize some of this stuff because the initial response somebody might say is, well, if you're going to, if you're going to improve 20 miles of this given roadway, uh, somebody would say, well, we've got to put a talking traffic light at every intersection. 
And that's probably not fiscally possible, but what we could do is based on our knowledge and interaction with the public is help prioritize those kind of funding decisions for the planners in the various jurisdictions. And this, is, this would be a tremendous opportunity for the three focus subcommittees or focus, whatever, whatever we're calling it, for the three groups to go take a look at these kinds of things, improvements to existing infrastructure and help the, the localities prioritize getting the best bang for the buck on things that are gonna cost money. So keep that in the back of your mind because I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to further engage with our jurisdictions. I have a great example for you. The US-1 bridge over the Rappahannock River is in the, the six-year improvement program. They have approved 63 or $64 million to renovate, rebuild, reconstruct that bridge. There's no requirement that they must put either a bike path or sidewalks on that bridge because it's a renovation of an old bridge. So this kind of a letter would say, hey, you need to pay attention to people that are disabled, <coughs> on bicycles, people that are going to walk, and don't just replace that bridge with a bridge for cars only. How is somebody else who doesn't have a car supposed to get across the river? Well, please, will you on at least one side of your bridge put a wide path for people in bicycles, wheelchairs, walking with their carrier bag or shopping to get across that bridge like they did on the Chatham Bridge. Mm -hmm. There is no requirement in law that they have to do that on the replacement or renovation of the US-1 bridge of the Rapanam. This letter will say, hey, please pay attention, we'd like you to do this because you're going to spend $64, $63 million rebuilding this bridge. Now's the right time to put in these accommodations because you're not going to come back and do it again later. So while you're doing it, please adjust the design so that you put these accommodations in. And I am, you know, on this particular project, trying to convince these up to alter the design so that we get a place for people to cycle across the bridge, walk across the bridge, be pushed in a wheelchair across the bridge, and not just replace the car facility. So this, because it's not codified as a requirement for future? A, for future, yes. It's a renovation of an old bridge, so there's no law that requires that they have to do it. If there is a renovation on, well, if, so if it's a new? If it's a brand new bridge, there, there are laws now about what you have to take into consideration. But for an existing bridge, you don't have to do it if you're just doing a renovation. But there's, there's going to be a significant, I mean, we're talking $64 million worth of renovation. This is not just a paint job. This is a major renovation. And so I'm saying as the head of FAMPO, it's in our jurisdiction, it's connecting Stafford and the city, and I really think that this is the time to put these accommodations in so that people who need other facilities have those facilities, and they're not required to do this. So I'm asking. Yes, yeah, see, this is, Thank you for that example. This is exactly how we can engage as a citizens committee because you can hold sensing sessions, you can get feedback. And then when you get your feedback, we can't do everything that somebody wants. So there's gotta be some kind of prioritization that we can propose to the decision makers that said, you know, based on feedback we've gotten, it should be this wide in terms of pedestrians or, or bicycles or if they can't afford it, you know, there's a sidewalk or something like that. that. Those are the kinds of things we can get engaged on, and we should. Because we won't get another chance. They're going to do it now, once, spend $64 million, and not touch it again for 50 years. So now the one shot we've got to say, do it now, please. Unless it's codified. Yeah, that would be great. I'm has, listening. Has VDOT given us any kind of a heads up or estimate of what proposing might cost? No, but what they did with the Chatham Bridge, which is pretty clever, is that they took the allowance for sidewalks on both sides and combined them into the space on one side to make a nice wide path with proper accommodations that you could fit a bicycle or a wheelchair or sure. something else. So within the space and the design, you can shift things so that you can accommodate that, but you've got to design it well. So I'm trying to... I'm going, I have, Hopefully a meeting to talk to the engineer who's going to be designing 
and the replacement bridge to say, hey, what are you doing, and see if I can submit them to, to make accommodations. Uh, I mean, please, you also talk to your favorite people. Too. It makes too much sense. <laughs> so you want to vote on this? I'm sorry? Do you want to vote on this today, right now? Vote on the what? Next letter. letter. Does anybody have any objections to the letter? I'm saying it's 7 p.m. Let's let's rock it, Mr. Chair. Let's do this. <laughs> okay. I make a motion to vote on this. Okay, to uh, send out the uh, letters on the This was an action yeah. item, wasn't it? All right, that motion's been made. Is there a second? Take a second. I'll second it. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, I'd like to call for a vote. All those in favor of authorizing the chairman to sign these letters as, as portrayed, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay. Is any, it, it says unanimous in the letter. Any, um, any abstentions? Motion passes. Okay. I have a question, please. Uh, sorry to go back to status update for the, uh, for the outer conductors, but um, is it the position of CTAC right now that we are moving forward with the two proposals that were shown before that were discussed at the last meeting, or is there still opportunities for other ideas moving forward? Is it, is it a working discussion that we're having right now, or is it like, okay, well, we're going to move forward with this, so we'll hold off on anything else for now? What I asked for the CTAC to approve was for me to brief a concept, and there is all sorts of space available to come up with the best solution for the municipalities uh, and for the region. So yeah, this is still wide open. Now, um, if there's no, no other discussion about the, the goals uh, and the amendment period for goals to the long range transportation plan is this summer? Last year. Why do you do it once a year for any amendments? So we don't typically amend the goals uh, more than every five years. Okay, so that, yeah. that was the reason. Because there's been a request, I suggested that we do the once a year review of the CLRP. We base it into that same process because, and the reason is this, the long range plan, if you change one comma, you have to go after the whole public comment period. And it's even worse, if you add or take a project out of the CLRP list in the long range plan, then you have to do the whole air quality conformity analysis again. So it, that's why I'm saying once a year, but by all means, bring all the amendments and we won't just do the CLRP, we'll amend the goals as well. Okay. Because we have to do the public process anyway when we do the CLRP, so we might as well do all of this at once. So once a year, I'm saying it's fair game to make amendments. We just don't like doing them every two months because it's such a schlep to do the whole process. The reason I ask is because I wanted to offer an alternative to some of the other things that we've been discussing as well, something that could work in concert with the other things that we've, uh, the other options that are out there, but I don't know what the sense of CTAC is right now for coming up with even more ideas to throw out there. We're, I, we have, we're actually going to go back to that agenda item. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't, yeah. Time in any way yeah. Like. We're now going to talk about so, that. So, so, can we finish with the letter? We're done with the letter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're done with the letter. Okay. Now, I'll carry on and do go back to item one. Okay. Okay. We have uh, the three the three slides uh, from uh, BPAC, and just scroll down to the, um, the next one there. As far as the. Um, there's a picture of, of the two of them together. Right. And what we've, uh, what uh, uh, CTAC has done uh, to date is, as we uh, indicated, we uh, reported this map was not provided to the policy committee. Um, Mr. Sharpenberg took the uh, existing maps of the outer connector and just showed policy committee the concept of taking um, and the uh, the line to the left of the screen uh, is uh, from uh, Route 3 at Lake of the Woods, where Coley has that cursor, and goes through timber property, forest land, and straight up to Warrington Road, US 17, through Stafford, crosses the Rappahannock River, and goes into Stafford County. The southern portion of that is Orange County and Culpeper County. 
um, those two uh, comprehensive plans and the Rapidan Regional Commission plan uh, does not show a road in that area, but it also does not show uh, any future development except for a small um, retail and residential down at Lake of the Woods where they currently have uh, sewer uh, capacity. The alignment to the right begins at Centerport Parkway and Route 1. It hugs the Potomac Creek, um, follows a power transmission line, and avoids uh, existing occupied residences. And the idea is to stop it at uh, White Oak Road, uh, primary route 218, about 600 feet west of Glebe Road. The, um, the next slide, Coley, if, if you could go down to the next one, the idea with the proposal and the supposition that CTAC used was to try to use existing uh, roads and existing bridge crossings. So in this slide, the dashed black line is the um, new proposed route. It stops there at 218 in, um, in, in Stafford, very close to the King George line. And then traffic can use uh, primary route 218 as it goes into King George County. It changes the road name to Caledon Road. Then traffic could go down Bloomsbury Road. That's the road where secondary road where the King George landfill is, as well as the trailhead to the Dahlgren Trail is right on Bloomsbury Road. Traffic can then uh, go use primary Route 3 and then to Port Conway Road, which goes down to 301. Traffic can then take the existing 301 bridge down into Port Royal. And uh, on Port Conway Road, um, it's uh, uh, a, a good secondary road. Uh, there's a lot of residential development. There's also a project BDOT has to uh, improve the safety at 301 and Port Conway Road to install a uh, uh, restricted uh, turn uh, movement called an R-cut median. Right now there are a lot of crashes because there's a lot of traffic trying to turn left into Port Conway Road northbound and folks trying to go northbound from Port Conway Road. So VDOT's going to um, use an innovative intersection design to help improve the safety there. Uh, and that's an active project. Oh yeah, it's on that curve there by the Ford dealership. Yeah, so they're, they're, uh, you call it a jug handle. Uh, they'll, they'll make it so you have to go uh, up past the road and then uh, turn okay. left, yeah. kind of make a, make a U-turn, a safe U-turn on the, on the lanes and then right. so kind of prevent the and it also eliminates having to put a traffic signal. That's sort of the traditional way, to, uh, and that can, creates a lot of congestion. So this R-cut uh, innovative intersection is a really popular um, uh, way to improve safety, but still let folks go in and out. So, so segueing into sort of next steps from my perspective is, I've reached out to the Stafford planners since the dotted line road from Centerport Parkway down to 218 is in their comp plan, but as a dotted line. And they, they would need to further refine the plot of that to avoid existing homes and other things that they shouldn't go through. Uh, and also on the western portion, propose a leg that would go from Highway 17 down to the uh, Culpeper County line, mm -hmm. I guess. So uh, yes. mm -hmm. there, they're working on that, uh, and then assuming they come up with something that makes sense, uh, Stafford Board of Supervisors would have to vote on that as an amendment to their comp plan, because they're solidifying a, a road that was just dotted beforehand and adding that leg down to the county line uh, on the western side. And again, one of the things I said to the policy committee is the intent of this is to allow people to proceed virtually in any compass direction but avoid I-95 Route 1 corridor because they could literally head up in any compass direction using existing roads like 28, 301, Route 2, 20, uh, and so on. And they still can hook back in if they choose to do so into Central Stafford, Fredericksburg, whatever. But it would remove impact 
on Route 1 and 95 and allow people to get across the river and maximize use of existing roads. So, assuming the, the traffic planners, uh, transportation planners and traffic come up with an acceptable solution that they can present to the Board of Supervisors, that would have to be a comp plan amendment voted on by them. I am also starting informal discussions with Culpepper and Orange planners, whoever that is, to let them know what we are considering, not decided, but what we are considering and get feedback from them as to their thoughts, concerns, questions, whatever. Uh, now, Stafford has to do its part initially because at least the Eastern one doesn't make any sense. The Western one is a start. They're assuming Orange and Culpeper counties are interested and would like to further discussion with decision makers, then it's time to get Spotsylvania engaged seriously for their comp plan contribution that takes it up from Route 20 up to meet the, uh, the legs that are being constructed down. Of course, I say sequentially, this is, a lot of this is simultaneously, but in terms of big picture, that's what it looks like. Now, funding. Uh, we were asked, okay, what are you willing to give up? At this point, we don't make that decision for starters. Those are decision makers, but also there are some funding streams that might be very attractive for whatever solution we come up with. A project like this, the creation of a new road, a couple of bridges on the Western connector and straightening and widening, not to, two, four, uh, to four lanes, but taking secondary roads, making them safer and putting on shoulders, that's gonna cost a lot of money. So there are some funding streams available and given the unique participants rural and uh, residential and so on in this area, there's a good chance we could be eligible for some of those, and we're talking several hundred million dollars for a project like this. Now, we have no idea what this would cost. This is still in its infancy, in its concept phase, but this is kind of the way that I'd like to proceed. Go ahead. Have we made a recommendation for these in terms of, is this at grade versus limited access, two lanes versus four lanes, or is it just kind of, this is a corridor of interest that we're putting out. That's a good question. The, well, Coley, if you could go up. The initial thought is improved two-lane secondary, secondary roads, making them better. Now, if somebody was to say, hey, look, we have a, a funding stream, we'd like to widen this to four lanes along a given leg, and they can come up with the money, by all means, that, that's their business. But if we are to get a solution at minimal cost, Let's take advantage of what we have and at the same time improve accessibility for bicycles and safety and all the rest of that. So we have not addressed the issue of limit access yet. That would be up to the jurisdictions because they want to help control, I guess, sprawl and everything else. But if you look at the plot, the plot of the road on the western side, good luck building something out there in terrain that doesn't perk for the most part. The plot out there takes advantage of really bad terrain to allow people through. And I, I, I personally would not see a lot of development, but I'm not the expert. It's basically an, an extension of primary route 20 is what the left uh, le leg is. A two, and the idea is an improved two lane road for both, not for any high speed or and, and not limited access. And on the Eastern side, what happens to that is, is a function of planners, but more importantly, the elected officials, because they're the ones that have to approve zonings or rezonings, if appropriate, pass comp plan amendments, and the ultimate weight of this is gonna be on them, as really it should be as elected officials. We can offer recommendations, and as we evolve this concept, we can make some proposals, but obviously we're not the decision makers. That's why I say it's still pretty much open. Uh, if I had Druthers, I'd probably like to see a two-lane improved road with limited access to allow people to get to the other side of the river and then peel off on existing roads, but I'm not the decision maker. But we're still into the concept development phase, and what you authorized me to do at the last policy committee is just pitch the concept, and that's what we did, to generate thought, and it seems we got some pretty decent response back from most of the jurisdictions. So the hard work is yet to be done. Yes, sir. One of the options that we could also put forward as we start looking at this is that if we are looking at an at-grade facility that you 
I think the category is called restricted access, where it's, you still have at grade intersections, but you don't have any driveways coming off of it. Mm -hmm. So I know that that's in use in a lot of places, and you know, then you're not, it's a safety situation too. We're dealing with a lot of that cross traffic coming in that is just a straight shot, but you're not, you're not throwing up lower leaves everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. And this is one of the things that I would have to defer to the transportation planners because there are some portions of this that lend themselves to not impeding on anybody very well. And there are some others on the east side, there may be some issues, but again, we don't have a final recommended plat from anybody yet. But again, as you, as you correctly uh, asked, this is still concept. And so I, I think some of the Stafford supervisors are reaching out to their counterparts on the Fredericksburg side of the river and asking them, what do you think? What do you think about crossing locations and stuff like that? So this will evolve. And, uh, but at least we've gotten people thinking about it, and based on the last policy committee meeting, nobody threw a chair at me or tried to kill me, which was a good sign. Any other questions about the status? When I go out and engage these two counties, it is strictly informal, and I just want to find out what do they think, what are their concerns, and report back to you as to where we are. Any questions? There was one question after you briefed that was, uh, it was specifically Fredericksburg, and it was who, was anybody there from Fredericksburg and, and approved this? And you said it was approved nine to four. I don't remember who specifically was, you know, for or against. And uh, I think that the person who asked that question, I don't know who it was, was online. I, I don't know who asked it. Uh, didn't really understand this, you know, we approved. In the, full, in the committee, the minute was to approve you going for it and putting together this initial conceptual design. I mean, not even design, I shouldn't say design, just okay. concept, initial concept proposal, lots of changes to come, a lot of unanswered questions, which you referred to, things we don't know. And you did that. And so when somebody said, did you approve this? Well, there's nothing really significant enough or developed well enough that we would actually be voting for it. Yeah. So it, he, he, I don't think he got the point you were trying to make, uh, unfortunately. So, uh, but it was kind of funny. That I think we approved the concept to look into it. Exactly, yeah. 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 Should yeah. it even move, start, get it started? It's start, exploratory. Yeah, you know, get the experts involved. So it kind of goes a little bit to Yeah, what I slipped in without you knowing is I wanted a right turn right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but that's, it's getting people to think about this in a serious way, right. and there's a lot of work that remains to be done. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about the project at Stafford that is in the plan to the east until brought it up. It's I had never heard anybody talking about it. No, it's it's drawn in the plan, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And I will tell you, Stafford has got some other issues they're going to have to decide upon because they've had a major rezoning that is going to hit them uh, any month now uh, in the vicinity of Centerport Parkway. And... I'm not going to proselytize my personal views on that right now, but there's a lot of things in the mix. And ready for it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that discussion to a sidebar after the meeting. Um, okay, any other questions about the status update of where we are? And please, if you have recommendations, this is the forum to do it, because based on what the, the current truth from this collective body is, that's what I want to feed back to people and say, what do you think? And if it changes, that's okay too. Sir. I brought a recommendation tonight if you'd like to see it. Please. Sure. All right. By all means. I actually have enough copies of this. I can provide an electronic copy if I need to. So basically, um, one thing that we've been talking about a lot is, sure, okay. sure. Okay, right. I'll, I'll sure. keep talking, I'll, I'll take one, pass it down. There you go. Okay, great. I don't need a copy of my own. So anyway, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is just trying to alleviate some of the traffic from 95 and to provide other options to get on the interstate. Uh, so, and this is a holy Stafford option that we have here. It's, if you see on one side, there's a uh, sort of triangular polygon that's drawn in. The issue that we have in Stafford between South Stafford getting to Central Stafford is that there are no connections for 
uh, cars between Route 1 all the way over to Kellogg Mill Road. Uh, you, have, you have the creek running through there, and there's never been a connector that's actually been uh, built or anything really in the pipeline for the most part. What I suggest is that we at least look into building a connector between the end of Plantation Drive and then going up to that curve at Centerport Parkway as it curves towards Interstate 95. This is something that's very similar to what's in the Stafford Comprehensive Plan right now. Theirs is a little bit different. It connects that curve for um, at Centerport Parkway to the intersection of Enon and, this real quick, Enon and not plantation. It's the uh, whole chapel. It's whole chapel. It's not really labeled on there, but it's over there by the cemetery. If you know, over there by the church with the uh, sort of a triangular cemetery at the curve of Enon. Uh, instead, my suggestion was to actually plug that into plantation using an intersection that already exists. It's just a thought that I'm throwing out there. The one thing that would help is to get a lot of that local traffic that otherwise would be coming down from the road to get on 95 at exit 133. Anything that's in that area could hop up to Centerport Parkway and uses an interchange that isn't nearly as used as the exit 133 is. So that's one of my suggestions. Can you put another one here what the proposal would be? You know, just do a second. It's on the side of the page. Yes. Oh, on another side. Saving paper. <laughs> This would essentially open up another cross in the Exactly. It's, it's, it's a Brito-esque option. I think his was uh, actually had uh, Centerport Parkway going out to the west. This is actually just staying a little bit more local, and it's a shorter. Sort of like a Brio Parkway modified. Yeah, modified. Yeah. So it comes into something. It's a lot shorter. It hooks up with a couple of existing connections. I don't know what the status of that is, but I'll it's, take it to them. It's on the comprehensive plan right now, but this is a slightly different alignment of something that you do have in the comprehensive plan. They just redid the comprehensive plan uh, just a couple months ago. Yeah, I think that has independent utility in addition to the two. This is yeah, great. Yeah. This seems separate from the issue of property right now. Right. But, but what the idea is, is that it will alleviate some of the congestion that you have there at Warrington Road as it tries to get onto 95. And then if you can at least alleviate some congestion in some of these areas, there could be a domino effect that extends across the route again. Because you're good local option. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Staff is beating a transportation study, and I'm going to try to get either myself or, or one of us who wants to volunteer as a member of that study group. Just so we have some feedback as to what's going on, but okay. We... It's just a thought that I put out there. One of the worries that I had about some of the other options is because, yeah, you know, when we first started talking about this, you know, it was kind of more in the line of perhaps a four-lane limited access freeway or something like that. This was a cheaper option. That having seen the discussion of, I'm sorry, I missed the meeting last month, but since it's more of a discussion. Of Sorry, corridors. we spoke about you while you were gone. That's right. right. <laughs> so this is more of a discussion about corridors rather than anything specific. And that's different. This can work in concert with that. Yes. It's, it's right. an option to just try to get local traffic that doesn't need to be on 95 off of 95. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a great idea. There are some. All right. There are some rumors associated with that rezoning. I'll leave them in. Forget that. <laughs> we won't even go into that. Thank you for this. Yeah. What about conflict with that? Those rumors. What's that? With this conflict of the uh, I'll wait till the meeting's over. Okay. And then I'll, I'll just pass it on. It's called Stafford Springs, and uh, it hasn't popped yet, but it's being reviewed. Is it that? Uh, 3,400 units. I don't think it's the same one. But there's, a net, there's one housing development just, it's, on, it's off the center port south of Mountain View. That's not the one. That's that is a different one. That is. Yeah. This is this is the son of George Washington Village. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Any other questions about that? Yes, ma'am. I do have a question. Um, this is great. Something. Uh, you said there's going to be a development up there. It is, it's being, it's starting to go through the review process. It hasn't been formally dropped. Well, I take it back. It has been dropped, but it's not available for public reading or public comment yet. And it's called Safford Springs. It basically puts 3,400 units from Courthouse Road south to Ramoth Church Road 
east, crushing west of I-95, right under the airport's flight pattern. Yeah. And since I sit on the airport authority, obviously you can see how I like about that. But anyway, go ahead. So, this is going to be my take on it. And I'm, again, everybody, I'm not a planner. I'm just here. If they're going to really put up these buildings and stuff, are the planners like active in this so we could so these planners could start talking about these roadways? Because if this is something viable and they just built these buildings without talking to planners, you know, because I'm finding this is the problem that I'm seeing, and again, I'm not a planner. If these buildings are going up, the planners don't know about it, the cities are just on these buildings, and these roads are just. You, you bring up an excellent point, and I hate to keep preaching to the choir, but all of us need to engage in other venues than just this. For example, when, when your locality has a planning meeting, they have public comment sessions where people are given the opportunity to see what's been done and speak up. You need to be there with your knowledge of what's going on here, what you've seen, and make comments for them to incorporate just that. Then the other thing is, to wherever we can, we need to embed ourselves like ticks into these bodies where we have feedback of what's going on and we can also inject considerations like you just pointed out. Otherwise, everybody operates in a thousand little stovepipes and you only see it when it comes into a crashing disaster or has to be reworked with a lot of money and all the rest of that. So, And as you know how I feel about public comment and getting the public comment out to the people is not accessible to all the people. It's not accessible to those who have access. Uh, again, I think this is great. I live near this area, so I, I think this is great because I've sat on 17 for a thing like Eon. But if they're just going to throw up a building and not even take this consideration, or they make the meeting to where he can't even get to them, or myself can't get to them, what is the other, what is the other option do I have to infiltrate? Because right now, I think this is... To me, this is actually good idea. It's, not, it's, it's viable for me yeah. because I live in the area. And it's not all my idea. I mean, the, the, the comprehensive plan for Stafford shows a similar corridor in there. So, so I, I know that so there would be some bias so for them. From the staff perspective, yeah. projects like that are not approved without the county planning board being involved. And it's that very reason that jurisdiction develops comprehensive plan to look into the future and which lists where they would like to build future roads. So when an application comes to a city, they have staff examine that application and I have not sat in the Stafford uh, planning office or in the um, planning committee's meetings, but they certainly, when they get an application for 100 units or something, they then compare that with the comp plan the plan, which has all of these future plans in it, to see whether it stress with that. So they don't just randomly go and say yes or no to a particular project without doing some work. And staff are mandated to go and do that work and make comments to planning boards and, and other people that make these approvals. And you just heard from the chairman talk about his proposal and about this proposal. Basically, are versions of roads which are anticipated to be built in the comp plan. So it's not like either of these proposals are out of the sky. They, they're already a version of something that is already in the comp plan, which they consider when they review those applications. You might feel they don't take it seriously enough. So that's a different question about does the planning board take these future planned roads? You might want to agitate around that question. They certainly are required to do a certain amount of due diligence when these applications come. And I think Becky was an engineer in uh, Spotsylvania County and would have probably had to do exactly that, make mm -hmm. comments on applications so that the planning officials, when they vote on a particular project, have got that information where the planned roads are in the future. So it's not a it's not like it's a circus out there, it's just that sometimes certain views are a little bit more dominant than perhaps we might like. Let me zero in on that one comment and give you a real fast through tutorial. Uh, Stafford, and I'm sure other jurisdictions are the same way. When a concept comes in, it's either inconsistent with existing zoning or not. 
if it's not consistent with existing zoning in terms of placement of stuff, then it requires a rezoning. So that leads to one level of review. Either way, whether it's ex uh, rezoning or existing zoning, they have a whole series of checklists they have to go through. What's the impact on schools, transportation, public safety? And have they been accommodated by the developer in terms of proffers? You've read the editorials. Uh, and invariably, developers don't cough up the amount of money that is associated with new development. The Planning Commission reviews all of these things and then makes a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. We have reviewed the plan. We find they have a, done all the wickets they should, or we find deficiencies in the transportation analysis or this analysis, and then they can vote whether to reject or accept the plan. That is not the final word. That is the recommendation that goes to the Board of Supervisors. And this drives me wild because if development by the county's own numbers is projected to cost $36 million in additional services that the taxpayers have to fund, and the developer only offers three, they're under no obligation to accept that plan. They can reject it if it's a rezoning. If it's by right, they can't. And so when you read these editorials in the paper, take it with a grain of salt. This is where we can get engaged by getting up in front, by writing articles, by standing in front of public bodies, be they planning commissions or boards of supervisors and saying, you need to be aware of X, Y, and Z. And I can tell you what, the bully pulpits are great things. When people know what the issues are from a strictly fact-based analysis, I trust people to make the right decision. But a lot of these things, they're not made in closed, behind closed doors, they're made in sessions of various bodies that nobody attends and doesn't bother to learn the details and make them evident to the populace. This again is where we can get engaged. I can help anybody here worm their way into Stafford kind of organizations. I depend on you to do similar worming for Spotsylvania, Fredericksburg, and King George. And I think we have some momentum where we can do just that. You got a question? Yeah, well, a comment really. Um, and this this is something I gave a, I gave a presentation some months ago about uh, to this body about um, organizations and, and the fundamental way they work. And this is something that's been tickling my mind since I, I joined the CTAC and since we had this opportunity to talk about what the role of the CTAC is. Um, and I wanna preface it by saying, I come from a management background and an engineering background, but I haven't done any kind of deep study of the organizations around here. So I can't comment on the specifics, but this is just my impression of it. There is a lot, and you mentioned siloing, there's a lot of siloing going on. The, the people who do the planning for the transportation and for the zoning and construction and for all of those other things, the, tra the transit, uh, all that, uh, tend to operate in different organizations. Now they have interactions between them, stakeholder meetings and that kind of thing. And it seems, uh, Hank, um, that your proposal is to overcome that siloing by using this body to sort of act as intermediaries between these different groups. And that's that's one, definitely one way to do it. Um, but to, to speak to your question, um, whether the people who build the buildings, the people who build the transport lines, the people who uh, uh, build, you know, are, are dealing with what the best way to incorporate mass transit is, it seems to me, just from my perspective here, that um, they do talk to each other. They do have interactions with each other at these stakeholder meetings. Um, but whether or not that is sufficient to produce a a consistently viable transportation system, it depends on a lot of things. So, uh, And that's where I think yeah. the advocacy component would, it, it, would but you're right. It, 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 they don't it, always yeah. have the, the weight behind the voice. It can help. I mean, us, uh, the, the problem is we, we are only but, so like, so we're not really, we're not the expert planners, we're not the expert modelers, we're not the expert budgetary people, we're not an expert in any of these things. Our only real option is to, and we're not even the expert surveyors, so in terms of our ability as a you know, voice of the people, we don't put the surveys out, we only really have us and whoever we talk to. So our, the, the bandwidth of this body with reference to collecting all of these different pieces of information and exchanging them across all of these different uh, disparate bodies uh, the, our, our, our time, our understanding, our expertise, and our literal amount of information we can understand, those are the limitations that we face. Absolutely, but it can't and, hurt. 
It can't, it's absolutely better than, than having no interaction. Exactly. Out of That's my point. That, I know you all have lives. We're not spending all of our time doing this, but if we can change two or three or four things for the better, that was worth it. I mean, his coffee is not even good, and he doesn't provide donuts. So we might as well do something at this meeting that, you know, will help in the lab total of it. Are there any other comments? Yes, sir. Anyway, just to put a bow on this, uh, it will be my suggestion that we put this as one of our priorities to one of our corridors that we can put a pin in that we're pushing forward. I'm not asking for a vote for this today. I'm just throwing a bunch of maps out, so that would be wholly inappropriate, but perhaps at the next meeting. Would you, would you help frame that so that people can take a look at it? Because it makes sure. sense. Yeah. Sure. Whatever materials I need to provide, just let me know. Okay. Maybe write a narrative that describes what of course. needs to be done. Yeah. All right. Would anybody else, any other comments about the, the update to the, the, the concept or the, uh, the accessibility letters that we voted on? Okay. Uh, public comment. Um, it's not included in your packet. We'll provide it to you uh, in the minutes, but Jane Leeds sent me a really excellent letter about some transportation solutions that she's encountered in San Diego. And just as important, her experiences as being a handicapped person and the implications of that. And I asked her, can I disseminate it to you all? It's a, it's a lengthy email, but it's well worth your time. So we'll provide that to you, we'll make it part of the meeting minutes. And if you have any feedback to that, I would encourage you at the, at the, the next meeting because it is an extremely useful document. I want Coley to um, disseminate that to folks yeah. tomorrow? Why, yeah, if we can get it out to everybody and then make it part of the meeting minutes. And I encourage you to, to, to give it some time because it's an excellent read. Are there any other written comments that we've received from the public? No, sir, but we need an open public comment period just to ask anyone if they have any public comments. At this. Anybody present or online that would like to make a comment? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, a couple of years ago, we spent a lot of time with Carol Ann Cassidy and Jane Leeds 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 and and the quality of the board is that. Thanks to the board of supervisors. We sent it to one supervisor. We didn't send it to this box. We sent a letter to one supervisor uh, in, I thought it was, you know, I guess it was. Yeah, I don't know if you received it, but I don't know if you received it. What was it? Um, and I'm sorry, I can't Transit. They want to know whether they could have transit services provided in Caroline County. Oh. And so we discussed it here at this meeting and decided that uh, we were not in a position to answer the question as to whether Caroline County had the resources to provide it. And so we referred the comments to the Board of Supervisors and um, yes, maybe we just sent it to one supervisor and asked them to discuss it or we sent it to the county administrator. But anyway, we sent the letter off. We did not get a response that I'm aware of anyway. Can I ask for a follow-up? Sure. Okay. Very good. Okay. Any other uh, staff, sample staff will follow up? Right. Yes, staff will follow up on a letter to Caroline County about uh, transit. About public comments about transit. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other public comments? Okay, correspondence? Do you receive any? No, sir. Okay. All right, staff reports. Also, no staff reports, sir. Okay, on item number 12, member reports, we are still looking for additional volunteers for those three focus areas. Um, we have maybe a, a, a lead for the mass transit advocacy and Matt is still doing the safety issue and traffic mitigation is sort of up there. We're all sort of massing on the objective, but if you want to participate, I'll be happy to brief you on what I think you can do as part of the committee to make a contribution. If you want to take a leadership role, terrific, but we would still like some more engagement on those three committees. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, I've requested to help out with this a couple of times and I haven't heard anything back. 
Which one would you like to do? For traffic mitigation. Okay. Ms. Jacob Flick. Are you leading it? What's that? Are you going to lead it? Well, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> no, I, just genuinely like help out here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I yeah. That, that's on us. Okay, you're on that one. And we, if you'd like a leadership role, we can have a discussion. I'll get with you at, at the end. Please. Any other? You don't have to volunteer in public. You don't have to raise your hand to be embarrassed. You just let Becky know or let me know. But we would like to get some more folks engaged because of all the things we discussed tonight, there's more work out there than we have people. So we need to start getting everybody to the degree you can and are willing to do so engaged. And there's no pressure on anybody. But if you want to participate, that'd be tremendous. All right, any other discussion about those member reports? Anything you want to bring up? Okay. I do. Please. I'm going to approach VDOT because I have a my VDOT account there. So if there's something that's in my craw, so to speak, I'll bring it up, which I've passed and they've been responsive. The thing that's bothering me right now is this cleanup along the roads throughout the region. They're finally, in April, doing a pretty good job, and they have this company in it. It's Townsend or somebody. It's a There's about six or seven of them, different yeah. companies. Yeah, I don't know if they have different ones, but I see the same trucks all the time. Yeah, they're all tandems, but they're different yeah. companies. Yeah. But I don't know what the priorities are because you know, where I live, in the, in the area I live in, I did a lot of cutting trees to clear roads to make them passable during the storm. So I know what's been sitting there since I cut that tree last, you know, and most of them are still there. And this is on Joshua. And then Poplar Road, heavily traveled road in that area. And it appears that they're just, you know, uh, I always say uh, that there are guys in VDOT that drive around in trucks all day. I know that's not really true, but I, I say that, and I don't see them stopping and taking a look at all that because it's there, and I see it every single day. Can, and, and can I ask you to reach out to them and, and ask what's their priority? Well, that's, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to ask VDOT yeah. because I've been patient for a long time, and I've seen it, you know, since the storm. And it's not, I mean, there is a definite pattern to the way they were doing things. They were moving kind of from I-95 outward west. They started clearing those roads. And, and some of them were really well cleared, and others weren't so well. So I don't know what their criteria is. Probably different contractors is my guess. Yeah, there, there's at least six different companies. But if, if the reason I say that is because I am... I have been on the third. I stole, I owned a tree service in Stafford County for a long time. I still have all the and it doesn't start getting cleaned up until I think it's Steve Haney at VDOT. So I'm going out there and I'm going to clean it up. That's how passionate I feel about getting it done because it's, it's just neglect and there, and I, I know they know which roads are more heavily traveled than others. They've done surveys, they've ran the pipes across the road, they've done a lot of things. I just don't see their logic now that we're out in the western lower density part of supposedly the lower density. Still building houses out there. But it's, it's a safety hazard. And I always say, and I've said it in here many times, there's no Stafford deputy that's going to pull somebody over on a two-lane road out there in western Stafford County. Too risky. And so there's no room. There's no shoulders. There's just ditches. And I've pulled a lot of cars out of ditches. So if you would see if you can get some kind of response, I will tell you that their projection is end of June. And if, if it is, and if you want an eye opener, drive out to the Stafford County landfill. There is a ski jump that will accommodate a 30-ton bulldozer constructed entirely of ground-up trees. Yeah, I, that's... It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. This thing is 30, 40 feet high, made out of mulch, that will take a bulldozer. Yeah. 
I just wanted to add that uh, I'm seeing the same stuff in Spotsylvania. There's a lot of roads, especially the road that I live on. Okay. There's, there's at least uh, three or 4,000 people that live in that general area. And the roads there, there's massive pine trees that are still laying there. And the community, like our community, chopped them up and kind of like made room ourselves on the roads because it wasn't getting done. But there's still like trees like everywhere and they like stick out too and I've, I've seen people yeah. actually damage their cars yeah they stuck out uh, especially me like especially at night uh i've almost made that mistake where it just scrapes the whole door yeah and well, i've actually scraped my yeah oh, and... well let's do this yeah, we'll provide ask the a question and then tell us feed back to me oh. where we can buttonhole the vdot representative at the policy committee meeting and say these areas apparently have not received any service whatsoever. It's a safety issue. What is your plan? What, what we need to do, uh, uh, Coley will send out the um, uh, website address for the VDOT report a problem. We did that after uh, we yeah, started that. Like I said, I have my VDOT account. Okay, so, so what's necessary is you need to go on and give the specific locations for those where those trees are in the VDOT report a problem site. And when you give your email address, they are, it's a, a work order number is generated from that request. And you can have a record of what you sent them. It also let, allows you to upload photos, but specific, for example, go in and say, you know, your name, email address, um, such and such road from here to here, debris in the side of the road. Make a copy of that. That's the uh, documentation we need to say, okay, that's been, that's been given. So rather than anecdotal, yeah, we, we actually give need, them your, something we need your work order copy, well, work order they, number so and so. Attach a photo to your. Yeah, so I'd say your two cases are the, are the test case right off the bat. Mm -hmm. and we we'll can, start afresh. So with sending that link, yeah. everybody go on and, and report their problem, and then whatever's printed off, let us have it so we can follow up. Are we able to add this to our next meeting? To make like basically take the month to to gather like our photos and and for the project. yeah if you'd like if you want yeah, to get something sooner item. than that great but that's we can make that item. part of an agenda yeah, yeah. that's a great idea give you the, the site there's a site to go to yeah. yeah yeah and you can attach photos and I'm not sure about video and I'm that. I'm sure they're overwhelmed I, I you know I I'm, I'm what I would like to think is that just because they haven't received the report of problems probably as a system but. VDOT Central Office is really solid about that. When that work order is generated, then somebody becomes accountable. Yeah. They find out where you are, it's sent to the headquarters, it's sent to the district. So putting that in the report of problem is so important. So can I just clarify, we are going to send the committee the web link for you to go and report a problem. Mm -hmm. Or we're going to send it now, like this week. Tomorrow, yes. And mm -hmm. then you can report your problem long before exactly. the committee meeting. Yes. You have to report it in the next week. Yeah, that's the important step. Just tell us yeah. 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 if you got a response. Okay. I'm sure you will. Any other questions or comments from any members? Uh, oh, I got one. Please. Wait, I don't want to like keep everybody here. I just had a, uh, I'm looking for some clarification. So we're an advisory committee and our objective, correct me if I'm wrong, is to aid in reducing mitigate or uh, traffic uh, congestion. Is that like one of our, okay. Hang on so, a second, hang on a second. The purpose of the committees of FAMPO by law mm -hmm. are to advise the policy committee. That's the legal requirement of what you do. Your current chairman has proposed the process of developing a mission. Is it a mission statement? Yeah, it was a and, mission statement. And now three kind of Group. focused areas of advocacy. Of advocacy. So it's not that you're here to fix congestion mitigation. It's that you're here to advise the policy committee and you've developed a mission to describe that you want to be more active and activist and you've developed three areas in which you would like to find problems, identify problems, and work on solutions that you can propose to the bodies that are responsible for solving them. Pro pro provide an added set of voices for them to consider as they make the decisions about resource allocation and things like that. Okay. Yeah, the reason why I brought that up is because I'm hearing a lot of talks about roads, and I know that's in its infancy stages, but uh, 
I forget who it was, but someone made uh, a great point that it doesn't matter how much pavement we put down, it's going to be it's, it's going to buy us some time, but it's still going to become a problem anyway. There's too many people coming into Virginia, um, and so I realized that if we wanted to reduce uh, and mitigate traffic, it's not just a roads issue; it's a multifaceted issue. Absolutely, it comes with speed limits, uh, construction, job times, and roads, and a few other things. And I would love to provide statistics, but I feel like we need to hit those general areas if we actually wanted to do something here and, and try to advise the people who can actually make a change. Because if we just add roads, it's not going to waste no, money. By no means. That's the, the sole purpose is not to add roads. My personal belief is the most pressing issue for our region is the log jam of 95 Route 1. And so short term, short to be fine as one, three, five, whatever, we need to do something to fix that. Now, there are other things that are going on simultaneously. East-West mobility study. There are routes in the area that lend themselves very well to mass transit, but there are other places that it doesn't because of the way the population is distri distributed, the density. The money doesn't exist to do all of those things simultaneously. So we, as part of our advocacy, is sort of separate the things that are most pressing from the things that should be done to the things that would be nice to do, however you want to prioritize that and make those kind of recommendations to the decision makers and help them frame, because this, this is a huge issue. Somebody once said, well, you can't pave your way out of this. I got it, but at the same time, unless you want to drop a 20 megaton bomb on Stafford County and start all over as an urban area, you're stuck with a set of preconceived or uh, pre-existing conditions that you have to work around. Similarly, in um, Spotsylvania and so on. Even Fredericksburg, which has the highest density in some areas, all of the mass transit solutions, traditional ones, don't necessarily work to the maximum advantage. So there's, there's a whole panoply of things that we need to consider and sort of pick and choose as we go forward. Like I said, it's a tough job. And we're just advisors, but if we don't advise and advocate, then it just falls back into the same unwashed mill. Just one comment from us, humble planner earlier. Huh. The <laughs> point that you make is a very valid one, and it's our job, Becky and myself and Coley and three other, four other staff that we have here, to advise you like we advise the policy committee and the other People are going to always want to go places. No matter the simple planning level, the alternative to building more transportation infrastructure to get them there is to put them closer to the places. I'm, I'm pulling it down to like very, very simple basics. I mean, they're complicated terms for all of this, but at a simple level, you can put the people close to the places that they need to go. And in the United States, we have a critical housing shortage virtually everywhere. And housing prices push people away to other places. So the housing prices in DC and Northern Virginia are pushing them into your counties and your cities, right? Yep. They're coming here because the housing is less expensive. What often controls, and this is something a lot of people don't want to hear, but I have to say it, I have to be the bad guy. Often what controls housing prices is zoning conditions. They're connected. So your zoning determines how much housing you have, and you know if you're an economist, the scarcity of a resource pushes the price up or down, depending on how much of the resource there is. So, if you don't allow housing to be built close enough to the jobs or the shopping, you got to push the price of that housing up, and everybody else that gets born, your children and your grandchildren, they got to find somewhere to live, and they can't afford to live in D.C. because it's too damn expensive, so they're going to come and live in suburbia 
or even worse, the exurbs, or even worse, in the rural parts of King George, so the King George people get upset because they've got a house on every hill now. What I'm trying to tell you is, in a nutshell, when you zone to push housing in a certain place and not in another place, and the place you're pushing the housing is nowhere near the jobs, nowhere near the shops, nowhere near the universities, you're going to create a force in the community to require transportation infrastructure to be built at great cost. Do you understand the economics of that? By, by forcing housing prices up in, in, in the central places where people need to go and pushing people out of the central places, you're then requiring other people to pay lots of cash to build these highway solutions to get them back to the place that they want to go in the first place. That's also an economic reality. So you've got to really try the other end of the equation. The one end of the equation is to build additional capacity, whether it's a road, a train line, a bus route, a cycle path even. Or you've got to find a way to rethinking the way you zone so that you can allow more housing and businesses to be built close by to each other close to universities, close to jobs, close to schools, so that less traveling has to happen to get to those places. Do you understand conceptually what I'm talking about now? So, one solution is you build more capacity on the roads and the rail. The other solution is you take away some of the need for the capacity for the transportation by changing the way you do the zoning. So when both Stafford and Spotsylvania have down-zoned, which means you remove some of those rights, and, and don't allow built construction of housing in the rural area, that's actually the right thing to do. Except that if you don't simultaneously upzone the central areas, you push the prices up and do nothing else. And then you force us at FAMPO to go try and find millions and millions and millions of more dollars to build another lane because that's the only other alternative. It's a chicken and egg. So on the one hand, that's why your question is so important. Your question is crucially important across the entire United States. You've got to focus on both those things, getting the zoning right and building the infrastructure to move the people. And they both have to happen. And Hank is kind of right, but the danger is that every generation is going to do exactly what Hank said. <laughs> It's right in one particular time, in one particular place, what you're saying. The trouble is, for all time, if that's all we do, we're never going to solve it. Because you've got to do the other part, which is zone up in the central areas. If you've already got a shopping district, we'll allow people to put apartments there. It's not going to affect you in your fancy house in the suburbs, because it's already commercial. For heaven's sake, why doesn't Central Park have office, uh, sorry, have apartment blocks? or condos, or anything like that. Because then you can walk out your front door, walk across the road, and go shop at Target. You don't have to get in your car in God knows where and drive all the way to Target. You can walk across the road. But no, we don't allow any housing in Central Park. For the first time, Spotsylvania voted to allow housing next to the Spotsylvania Mall, the whatever it's called. Right? That's the right thing to do. But we've done it now once, or some total of one. <laughs> you so what I'm saying? I do have to use. So there, there is a proposal in the small area plan for in Fredericksburg to actually add that housing to the southern part of the central part. Good. Do more of it. So you have two choices. You can either throw up your hands as, as this is impossible and go home and drink heavily, or we can start getting engaged where we won't solve everything but if we can start coming up with some smart recommendations that planners can adopt, because what you've advocated is absolutely correct. It's also very hard, but I'm not willing to say it's too hard, don't do. And I hope you all are of the same mindset because you're here. Let's get on and get some of this stuff underway. And thus endeth the sermon. I'm sorry, go ahead. Just a comment on the uh, very good description of that, I think. I, I might be wrong, but I disagree with me. Please say. Embry Mill in Stafford. Embry Mill development is exactly the type of 
developments you're, you're referring to. I'm not familiar with it. Yes. But the concept is called mixed use. No, that's yeah. that's Embry Mill. Embry Mill. I sit on their CD. You have Publix, big store there, just put it in. The big swimming center, the Jim mm -hmm. Ross swimming center is there. there there's uh, strip malls strategically placed through the zoning around Embry Mill. And I don't know what the population is in Embry Mill. I'm afraid to ask. When, it's, it's, when they finish building that out, 2,400 units. Of mixed use, oh, cool. age restricted, and so on. And pretty upscale. Uh, I mean, it's up. It's, it's, it's closet. It's pretty expensive. Uh, I'm not arguing that every place is pretty expensive, expensive, but they put them together. They I remember the discussions before when they were conceiving Embry Mill, Stafford County, and that was exactly what you said. Move people closer to the services they require. Correct. And, and yep. keep that thought when the discussion about staff, downtown Stafford comes up. Yes. Because that will be a major fight. But yeah. anyway, I, I'm sorry, I, I digress. Yeah. In the interest of time, anybody else have anything they'd like to oh. offer? And don't let me cut you off, but any other, yeah. I, it's, a, <laughs> it's a mix. So they've got it's a tremendous community. Yeah, see right there. They got the. I would say that uh, I, I actually mm -hmm. come from Fairfax. Uh, I am one of the people who moved down here because I can't afford it up there. Uh, <laughs> and you do see up there. I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I also do see up there mixed use. There's a new, uh, a new community in Merrifield uh, over by Gannon that is. Um, that embraces that you know, apartments on top of shopping and it's yeah. things like that. So that does not bring prices down. So well, it's, it's, it's not it's a question. Right right the mix, uh, so let me just clarify that if the mixed use itself is not going to just because you mix it up bring the price down. It's the volume. volume. You have to have volume. So you have to have enough new property okay. coming onto the market. And across the entire United States right now, we have a shortage of housing. So because the net is that there's more children being born, more people moving into neighborhoods than the housing available, the price is going to go up. So the mixed use stops you having to drive your car to the shop, and we're a transportation uh, thing. But it doesn't stop the price going up. What stops the price going up is you have enough mixed use developments to keep the prices reasonable, and that means lots of construction. But you have to have the zoning to allow the construction to happen because if you don't have the zoning to allow it to happen, not enough will get built, and therefore the prices will be very high. So, I mean, why why do we think the prices of new homes and, and existing homes in the United States right now are so high? Well, it's because we're not building as much as the need is increasing. So the only way you fix that is build more. And some people don't like the other either, but that's the fact. The fact is. You don't want to pay so much money. We've got to build twice as much as what we're building. Or, you know, and I'm not saying what kind we have to build. We can build small, pokey, cheap apartments or massive mansions. And then the flip side is somebody has to pay for the services to support those people. But that's, no. but, but that's one of the reasons why you have to build density. Right. Because the pipe, the sewer pipe, the water pipe, the road, yeah. the longer it gets, the more expensive it is, and the, more, the, the fewer people that live along the road the higher the cost per unit. And the more kids, the more schools. Are you uh, accepting? This, I tell you, this is, a, this is a very complex thing. Yeah, uh, I just got my seat. And ideally, some of these so, the sidebar discussions could take place as part of these subcommittees, and then you can come on back and, because this is huge, folks. Unless you want to spend eight hours every week here, we wouldn't even scratch the surface. So again, my, my starting in position was, let's sort of organize for combat, focus on those things we can affect so that we can tee up informed recommendations to decision makers. Yes, sir. Motion to adjourn. Second. There is a motion. Dave's one. Dave's one seconded. All in favor. Aye. 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 We didn't have discussion, but that's okay. Aye. Any opposed? All right, meeting is adjourned.